Okay, very good. Well, I'll take uh, a little bit more than half an hour to uh, talk about one aspect of uh, Brownian dynamics. And uh, I think you've already had some introductions to that uh, in the morning and afternoon there. Uh, the topic that I'm going to cover is uh, the effect of opening and closing of binding sites on the uh, rate of binding in diffusion controlled reactions. And, and we've used mostly Brownian dynamics to probe this. So uh, what I'll do is uh, start with uh, a reminder that I did very little of the work that I'll actually be talking about. Uh, it's mostly due to very good graduate students and postdocs and some senior collaborators. And you'll even see one little hint of Rebecca Wade's work at the uh, very end. Um, this is part of a larger talk that I often give on uh, rates of enzyme catalysis where we uh, start with the simplest ideas of uh, enzyme kinetics and then show how we can try to deal with all the complications of uh, real enzyme systems. Uh, in the simplest case, of course, one typically has this Michaelis-Menten kinetic scheme where the enzyme E and the substrate S first come into contact by diffusion to form an enzyme substrate complex and then that might uh, yield uh, products P with a rate constant K forward or the enzyme substrate complex might dissociate to uh, yield the original substrate in an unreacted form. Um, at steady state, uh, when all the initial transients die down, you can use uh, the simple back of the envelope derivations to show that the effective rate of disappearance of substrate, uh, and, and bracket S, of course, is the molar substrate concentration as a function of time. Uh, that's simply uh, given by this uh, uh, second order effective uh, rate equation. Now, in the case that uh, the reaction is, is very fast, uh, the KF is very fast or KR is very slow, uh, you get a diffusion controlled reaction where the uh, only thing that survives from this uh, uh, expression on the lower right is the uh, rate constant KD for the initial diffusional encounter. And the Smolyakowski theory from uh, 1917, almost 100 years ago, uh, says that for two spherical reactants that are reactive uh, in any uh, form of collision uh, and there's no interaction between the reactants if they're of equal size, the rate constant comes out to be something like 6 or 7 times 10 to the ninth per mole per second or about 10 to the tenth per mole per second. So this is one of these uh, uh, units that's good to remember. Um, of course, real enzymatic reactions uh, typically do not involve spherical molecules. The surfaces are not uniformly reactive, but rather there's a, an active site that's highly localized on the enzyme, and the substrate may have to have a particular orientation to productively collide with the active site. Uh, usually there, there is some sort of significant attraction or repulsion, electrostatics or what have you. What I'll focus on here is that uh, the enzyme typically can't be viewed as a rigid object, but rather something that fluctuations that influence its reactivity. Uh, in general, the reactions are not in the steady state regime, uh, and in general, we're not dealing with dilute uh, substrate concentrations. And so uh, these are all things that one can deal with using Brownian dynamic simulations with more realistic models. The particular case that I'm going to focus on is an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. It's the uh, green object, the green spherical object in the center of this picture, and it uh, is found uh, typically in synapses of certain kinds, so-called cholinergic synapses, where you have a, a, a presynaptic neuron or the axon of a, a nerve cell. Uh, that's interfacing with another nerve cell, uh, typically on a dendrite or perhaps with a, an end organ like muscle, in which case you have a neuromuscular junction or uh, adrenal glands or other glands. Uh, but the important thing is that there's uh, an electrochemical pulse called an action potential that runs down the axon and causes voltage-gated calcium channels to open up. The calcium ions flow into the 
presynaptic neuron and interact with uh, vesicles that are loaded with about 10,000 molecules of acetylcholine, a small positively charged neurotransmitter. Uh, the vesicle then fuses with the presynaptic membrane and releases these neurotransmitter molecules, the acetylcholine molecules, into the synapse where they have to diffuse across a gap of about 500 angstrom units or 50 nanometers and bind to uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Those receptors in turn open and allow ions to flow into the postsynaptic uh, cell and trigger an action potential in that postsynaptic neuron or muscle or organ tissue. The uh, acetylcholinesterase, this green blob, is an enzyme that's basically there to clean up after this parade of neurotransmission. Uh, it hydrolyzes the acetylcholine molecules extremely rapidly to reset the synapse for another round of, of excitation. And in the case of neuromuscular junctions, you can imagine that these have to work very, very quickly uh, because of the pressure of evolutionary forces. I often tell my students when I give physical chemistry classes that uh, the people that might have been your ancestors who didn't have very fast synapses or neuromuscular junctions, uh, they were the ones that got eaten by the saber-toothed tigers. And so there's a very strong evolutionary pressure to have the fastest possible turnover of activity in synapses so that you had very good reflexes and able to move uh, to defend yourself or escape. Uh, so acetylcholine is a very, very fast enzyme, and yet there are some some puzzles about it that we've been studying uh, for a number of years in a sort of a multi-scale strategy to look at the chemistry of the active site by quantum mechanics and transfer information from that level to the uh, intact enzyme shown here as a dimer in the middle and then take rate constants that we've extracted from for example Brownian dynamic simulations on this dimer taken those rate constants and embedded them in larger scale finite element models of, of synapses to try to replicate experimental data on uh, nerve cell activity. The puzzle about acetylcholinesterase is that the active site is buried very deeply in what uh, people have called a gorge in the enzyme. This serine 203 is the uh, catalytically most important residue and it's at the bottom of a 20 uh, angstrom deep uh, channel uh, from the surface of the enzyme and in fact the enzyme in all the x-ray structures that have been developed of it is actually in a closed form as shown on the right hand side uh, so that the uh, acetylcholine molecules are actually somewhat too large to fit into the entrance to the active site in the normal state of the enzyme. Uh, in fact Molecular dynamics simulations have shown that the uh, enzyme undergoes fluctuations between open and closed states, but it's really in this closed state something like 99% of the time. Well, this presents a, a quandary. How can the enzyme work so quickly when it's closed perhaps 99% of the time? Why would nature do something like that? Well, here we start to get some clues as to what uh, enables the enzyme to be a very fast, in fact, uh, diffusion-controlled enzyme uh, operating as if uh, nearly all of the surface of the enzyme were active. Uh, one clue is that the opening and closing is largely governed by the motions of local aromatic residues, these uh, phenylalanine and tyrosine residues that form the bottleneck of the active site. Being small, these uh, side chains can turn and rotate and move in and out of the bottleneck very quickly so that while the enzyme may be in what on the left hand side here is shown as the closed state uh, and although it might be closed 99 percent of the time there are these opening transitions about every picosecond or even every half picosecond or so because of the very rapid movements of these uh, local side chains. So. Um, how to, how to understand the kinetics of these enzymes, this uh, mostly closed uh, enzyme that fluctuates open and closed very quickly, but again is closed most of the time. Uh, how to understand the kinetics of these? 
Well, uh, there's sort of two levels of treatment that have been taken in thinking about these things. The first was to just think about the target by itself and its opening and closing dynamics and what the consequences of that dynamics would be for uh, the binding and reaction of a small molecule. Uh, at the very end, I'll talk about simulations in which both the target and the substrate are treated explicitly for more detailed uh, modeling of these systems. So uh, there has been theoretical work uh, on the kinetics of these problems going back uh, almost 20 years now, 30 years, 30 years now. Uh, a paper that Scott Northrup and I uh, wrote to describe the general problem and a very simple approach to it. Um, this was uh, improved markedly by uh, the uh, very clever mathematical analysis of Attila Zabo and particularly by uh, Chang Zhou, who I should be there with you somewhere. I think I see Chang. Uh, hi. <laughs> and uh, Chang is a very, very clever uh, mathematical physicist who developed much of the underlying theory that uh, is uh, embedded in what I'm going to talk about. The last reference here is where uh, Chang and, and uh, Stan Lodek, who did the molecular dynamics simulations on acetylcholinesterase, and I uh, put together all the pieces of the kinetics of this enzyme, the dynamics, the opening and closing rates, and uh, Chang's theory uh, to develop this, this model. So here's a picture of Chang, so you'll know who he is there. Um, so uh, again, there's this bottleneck that we need to deal with, and there's this opening and closing that we need to deal with, and the mechanics of the gate are governed by these very fast motions, picosecond timescale motions of these aromatic residues. Well, in fact, uh, this picture is enough to begin understanding how the enzyme can really sustain a very high rate of speed, essentially diffusion-controlled kinetics, uh, as if the gate were always open, uh, because we have two time scales to consider, and the difference between these two time scales uh, makes it possible to understand how the enzyme can be so effective. Uh, the opening and closing, as I say, happens very quickly on the picosecond time scale. But if you have a substrate molecule, one of these acetylcholine substrates, that moves into the entryway of the active site while it's still closed off, it takes a much longer time for that substrate to escape, something on the order of nanoseconds for it to diffuse away a significant distance. So during a typical encounter, there will be many opening opportunities uh, to the active site that the substrate can take advantage of and slide into the active site and undergo catalysis. So even though the uh, active site is closed off most of the time, uh, the door opens frequently and the substrate has access to this critical catalytic serine residue. Uh, Chang's theory uh, takes the following form if you actually sit down uh, with pencil and paper and work out the equations. If you have an enzyme or other receptor that can undergo transitions between open and closed states, and a system closes with a rate constant omega c and opens with a rate constant omega zero, then you can show, Chang showed, that the rate constant and the presence of gating, uh, k sub d, uh, is equal to the rate constant that you would have k sub open uh, with the gate always held in its open form plus this important correction factor. Uh, the important correction factor uh, contains the elemental rates for the process and this quantity kappa hat, which uh, is simplest to describe in a sort of a thought experiment. If you have the enzyme always held in a closed state for a very long time so that the substrate builds up an equilibrium concentration distribution around the enzyme, and then the enzyme suddenly opens and you probe what the flux of substrate is into the active site, uh, and then you take the uh, Fourier transform of that, uh, or Laplace transform, you get this uh, uh, kappa hat of omega, which uh, among other things brings in the uh, diffusion constant for the substrate into the analysis. Uh, 
Now it turns out that this uh, equation uh, for the gated rate as a function of the always open rate in this correction factor uh, can take two limiting cases. Uh, the first limiting case is the case of fast gating, which I have already described to you for acetylcholinesterase. That's the case where the opening and closing happens very quickly on the time scale for diffusional escape of the substrate. And here the time scale for diffusional escape is given by this capital R squared, which is sort of the dimensions of the binding region of the enzyme, divided by D, which is the uh, effective diffusion constant for the enzyme to escape. Again, that's on the order of a, a nanosecond or so for acetylcholine near the binding site of the enzyme. And uh, so we're in the regime where uh, the reciprocal of omega is much smaller than tau sub d. Again, omega minus one is on the order of picoseconds or less than a picosecond. In the case that you have slow gating, uh, this would be a case where uh, the substrate can diffuse away quite quickly or where the motion of the gate is very, very slow. So it's closed a long time and then open a long time and then closed a long time. Then you get what might be a more intuitive situation where the rate is just the fraction of the time that the enzyme is open times the rate constant you have when the enzyme is open. So the enzyme opens up for a long time, the transients settle down, you get the steady state rate that operates for a significant length of time, and then the enzyme closes and you have no reactivity during the closed period for a long time. And so this simple uh, fraction of open time uh, is the governing thing. Uh, so for uh, fast intramolecular gating, uh, within a single monomer of this enzyme, and as I've already hinted at, the enzyme actually functions as an oligomer, and I'll say more about that in a moment. But for a single monomer of acetylcholinesterase, um, we're in this fast intramolecular gating limit. Again, uh, omega to the minus one is a fraction of a picosecond, tau d is on the order of nanoseconds. And so the enzyme is effectively uh, as active as if the bottleneck were always open. We're not even there. Now, um, as I've mentioned, the actual form of the enzyme in uh, synapses is a tetrameric form. And the tetramer is such that when you look at crystallographic structures, uh, the presence of one protein next to another protein in this tetramer can block access to the active site. And so uh, several postdocs in the group uh, looked at the consequences of gating motions involving the relative motion of these protein uh, uh, subunits in this, this tetramer. Uh, Alex Gorfe, who did this work, is now a uh, faculty member at the uh, University of Texas Medical School in Houston. And what uh, Alex and Chayan Chang and Ivelo Ivanov did was to run molecular dynamics simulations of some of these tetramers. And here uh, in the left-hand side cartoon, you see what's actually sitting in the synapse are these long uh, helical collagen-like stalks that are embedded in the postsynaptic membrane, arborized into these branches at the top of this, this tree-like structure. Each branch has one of these tetramers of acetylcholinesterase uh, monomers bound to it. And again, the active sites can be shielded in certain conformations of the tetramer. So uh, these uh, postdocs ran molecular dynamics simulations on uh, entire tetramers of this structure and analyzed the principal components and used those to estimate the frequency of exposure of the active sites in the tetramer and came to the conclusion that here we actually have slow uh, gated processes. Uh, it takes about 50 nanoseconds or so for these protein residues to rotate and move apart from one another to expose an active site. And again, the escape time of the acetylcholine small molecules are 
faster than that on the 10 nanosecond time scale. So we're in a regime now where the uh, process is governed by the frequency uh, or the fraction of the time that the active sites are available. Um, it turns out that when you look at the structures, the system is open about 85 percent of the time. So in this case, that's not a very serious kinetic penalty. So uh, we see nature using interestingly different strategies at the level of the single monomer and at the level of the tetramer, where in one case uh, nature uses fast gating to sustain high reactivity, and here at the tetramer level, uh, we're using a more static uh, uh, average structural property to ensure fairly rapid uh, kinetics. And uh, I just have a couple of other examples and then I'll move into some concluding discussion. Uh, Rob Swift, who is a graduate student in the group, uh, more recently has looked at a rather different type of process. This is uh, an enzymatic process in which uh, an enzyme puts what's called a a capping structure on a messenger RNA molecule. Those of you that have had some molecular biology courses probably are aware of the fact that uh, messenger RNAs, when they are uh, made, uh, involve several complicated steps. There's the uh, step of pre-messenger RNA synthesis from the DNA genome in, in uh, most organisms. That uh, pre-messenger RNA molecule is processed in several ways. One is, is by so-called splicing reactions that uh, put the information uh, containing units together in the appropriate way. And then the five prime end of the messenger RNA has to have a special group attached to it uh, in order to be uh, properly recognized and processed by the ribosome to make proteins. So there are capping enzymes that put the special group on the end of the RNA and Rob was uh, very interested in those uh, and studied their structure and dynamics. Here's a picture of one of these capping enzymes. There's a domain that binds to the nucleic acid. There's a domain that is responsible for some of the chemistry involved uh, using uh, ATP molecules to uh, position adenine residues in the appropriate geometry to bind. And like many hinge-bound enzymes, this enzyme can undergo very large conformational changes that open and close the active site. Um, again, uh, Rob Swift did long molecular dynamics simulations on the uh, APO enzyme, that is with no ATP bound, and found these structures that you see along the bottom of this cartoon. and a molecular dynamic simulation with an ATP bound gave the single rather uh, unchanging structure that's seen at the top of the, the uh, uh, cartoon here. And the uh, opening transitions, the distance between these two domains of the uh, enzyme are shown for the, uh, the liganded enzyme in the dashed lines and for the APO or unligated enzyme in the solid line. What you see is that for the uh, APO enzyme, the one that's ready to, to do something and bind ligands, uh, there actually are, are several states involved uh, and the structures are sort of shown over the uh, distance between the lobes uh, that are sampled. Uh, there's a very closed up structure on the uh, left hand side along the bottom. There's a sort of a slightly open structure which is also seen crystallographically um, in the middle. And then there's what Rob calls a hyper open form which occurs a significant fraction of the time uh, shown over on the right. Well if you do Brownian dynamic simulations of ATP molecules to see how deeply they can penetrate into the active site, uh, you can get cartoons like these which show the largest inaccessible spheres or the surfaces that an ATP molecule can move to in the hyperopen form on the left and in the partially open form on, on the right. Well again, uh, doing an analysis of how often the uh, ATP molecules have access to the active site, uh, Rob found that we're very close to being in a fast gating limit for this enzyme. So again, 
uh, an enzyme that needs to operate fairly quickly to keep producing effective messenger RNA molecules uh, seems to have uh, these gating processes uh, aligned in order to ensure uh, fast action of the enzyme. Um, the last few minutes I was going to mention some tangents on this work. One is uh, simulations in which both species are treated explicitly are clearly the way to go in the future because uh, you might imagine that uh, it could be important when a substrate molecule gets its foot in the door of an active site and, and wriggles its way in that the interaction between these reactants might be uh, important in determining what the actual time scales are for these processes and that can be seen by looking at both species explicitly and the first simulation of that kind was actually done by Rebecca Wade when she was a postdoc in our group in Houston working with uh, uh, Brock Ludy and uh, this work was actually published when she was off in Heidelberg uh, with her own group and, and Eugene Demchuk was working with Rebecca. But this is looking at the enzyme triose phosphate isomerase where uh, one of the substrates uh, gap is a small polar molecule that uh, can bind to the enzyme when a flexible loop shown in color over on the top right hand end is in the right conformation. And uh, what Rebecca found in this case is that you could uh, assume that this enzyme moves into something uh, approximating the diffusion controlled kinetics and that's what's observed experimentally because even if the loop motion is a little bit slow, uh, it was seen to be on the nanosecond time scale here, uh, the active site is essentially available something like 50 percent of the time. So even in the, if we're in a slow gating or close to the slow gating regime, uh, we're in a situation again where the active site is largely exposed. Now when the substrate actually moves in and, and the loop closes down, it does form a structure that's uh, sort of specially uh, designed for catalysis excluding solvent molecules and the actual turnover rate is, is a little bit slower than the binding rate here because it's limited by the rate at which the, the loop has to open and uh, turn over. So that was an early study of this kind. A more recent study of this kind was done by uh, Chayan Chang, who's now a, a chemistry professor at the University of California at Riverside when she was a postdoc in the group. And Joanna Trilska was involved in this work. I think she's there somewhere. Um, Joanna, hello, I see your hand waving. Um, so uh, this was to look at uh, HIV protease, uh, an enzyme that again has substantial conformational changes associated with the binding of substrates or inhibitors and here are two structures taken from a molecular dynamics simulation. Uh, the light gray structure, the gray structure is one in which the so-called flaps over the active site are in a relatively closed state. The darker structure is one in which these flaps have opened up to allow access to the active site. Uh, what um, Chan Chang did was to take a coarse grain model of the polypeptide uh, developed by Valentina Tosini and Joanna Trilska and use this coarse grain model shown on the right hand side to do Brownian dynamic simulations of the enzyme. But Brownian dynamic simulations in the presence of a uh, substrate molecule, again represented in coarse grain fashion. And I could show you a movie, but it's faster, I think, just to show you a sequence of snapshots from one Brownian dynamics encounter of the substrate with the enzyme, showing how the substrate moves up toward the enzyme, but it's not, the enzyme is not quite in the right geometry to accommodate the substrate. So there's a little tango between the, the substrate and the enzyme until finally the right disposition of all the elements is found to allow uh, binding and catalysis and release of products. Um, these simulations have actually been useful in uh, uh, replicating uh, the ordering of the on rates of different uh, drug molecules and binding to the enzyme. That is, we can get good agreement with the experimental speeds of binding uh, 
uh, by using simulations such as these. The uh, HIV protease is in the slowish gating regime. Uh, that is, the gating motion is somewhat sluggish compared to the uh, escape rate of, of typical small substrates or large drug molecules. And this could have something to do with uh, the effectiveness of certain mutations that lead to drug insensitivity. I show here that the wild type is open about 14 percent of the time, but one of the most uh, important uh, drug insensitive mutants is open uh, much less of the time, and that could have a little bit to do uh, with the drug insensitivity. We don't really know in detail. Uh, just a couple of things to close. One is uh, anticipating some things that will come up later in the meeting. I've talked about simulations in which we've done Brownian dynamics with uh, just a single diffusing species encountering another single target molecule. Uh, what if you have many, many uh, target molecules or many, many ligand molecules? Uh, Brownian dynamics uh, can get stressed if you have lots of molecules, but uh, there is room to do things, and you'll hear that in the next talk in uh, a dr very dramatic way. If you have lots of very small molecules, uh, ligand molecules approaching a target, then it can be useful to switch over to a continuum level treatment in terms of the concentrations of the ligands. And so this is what we do when we look at these models of entire synapses as we switch over to concentration language and use finite element methods to solve the Smolyakowsky equations or the Poisson-Nernst-Planck equations uh, for these larger scales of the system. And that allows us to deal with the uh, realistic, uh, in this case, uh, electron tomography described structure of neuromuscular junctions where the synapse has this very, very complicated topography with the folds and the postsynaptic membrane shown in light green there. Um, again, uh, we'll hear more about these continuum level models in uh, Pete Katanis Husky's talk and perhaps some others during the, the meeting. I'll conclude and just uh, say again, uh, these are the folks that really did all of the work, and of course Rebecca Wade, uh, and I thank them for all their efforts. I thank you for your patience, and uh, if there's a minute or two, I'll try to answer questions if time allows. Thank you. So do you want to do questions at your end first? Uh, that's probably a good idea. Any questions here? Everyone's convinced here. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions there? I, I have one question. Oh, there is a question here. Are you, are you using the, the complete Brownian dynamics uh, with, with the hydrodynamics here? Or, uh, uh, so uh, Garv Arya is asking if we are doing full Brownian dynamics, including hydrodynamic interactions. And actually, no, in this case, we actually neglect uh, the hydrodynamic interactions. I know there's uh, some work being described there about better ways to include hydrodynamic interactions. Uh, Gary Huber here has been doing a lot of work on trying to speed hydrodynamic interaction calculations because they, they are important in some problems. For the problems I described, they probably only contribute effects on the order of 10 percent or so, but there are cases where uh, the hydrodynamic interactions are much more dramatic, much more important. Uh, Adrian Elcock has run into this with protein folding calculations, for example, if you have a strung out polypeptide molecule where uh, all the residues are highly exposed to solvent, you're in one hydrodynamic regime, but if you fold it up, then you're shielding all the interior residues from hydrodynamic flow and getting uh, a dramatic difference in the effective frictional constants. So uh, it's an important area to work on. Any questions from Heidelberg? You're all convinced. <laughs> well, good. I think probably we should go ahead and move along. Well, there, is a, there, is a, there is a question here. I don't okay. know what you can hear it. Do you try? Don't get off that easily. Um, is that even an alcohol? Oh. Quick question. Uh, so 
you showed that when you do uh, MD simulations of uh, an ACH and tetrama, that you get somewhat different gating uh, kinetics from when you look at a monomer. Uh, so I'm wondering, you, you pointed out that uh, in vivo you actually have these clusters of three tetrama. Do you think there's any scope for there being changes in the gating caused by the association of tetrama? I did, I'm not sure I followed the very last part of the question. Could, could so you? I, I will try to repeat. Uh huh. So Adrian is Adrian is asking whether when you have uh, clusters of three tetramers of acetylcholinesterase, uh huh, whether this affects the gating that you're seeing at the tetramer level. Yeah. Okay. That's a good question. We frankly haven't really looked at that. Uh, my guess is that it's probably not a, a large factor because, uh, again, electron microscopy shows that these uh, clusters of tetramers are somewhat isolated from one another in this uh, arborized uh, tree-like structure. But we haven't actually studied that. It's possible that there could be some sort of associations among tetramers that could uh, gum up the works to some extent. Probably not very much simply because it would be counterproductive in terms of the uh, enzymology of the system. But we haven't really looked. So probably to move, to move ahead, maybe we should go ahead and turn it over to Adrian. I think he's next. Right, let's do that. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you.